for our first time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really very happy to welcome you, all of you, in great numbers to our tonight's event, um, to Richard Lane's talk, How Does Psychoanalysis Work? Freud's enduring legacy in light of 21st century systems neuroscience. Um, Professor Richard Lane uh, will deliver this talk uh, tonight. He just arrived in Vienna last week and will, he will stay for the next four months in Vienna. And Richard, we are really happy that you made it to Vienna, that you are here. Uh, Richard um, is a professor of psychiatry Psychologi uh, psychology and neuroscience at the University um, of Arizona, and he is the Freud Fulbright Fellow. Um, and therefore, he will spend four months with us, and we are really happy that you accepted the idea that you would already do a first talk in order to introduce um, your research project, because there will be another talk at the end of this day. Save the date, it's Thursday, uh, 29th of June, 7 p.m. here again. So, um, I will then pass the word to Hermann Argens um, from Fulbright uh, Austria. I'm very happy that you joined us here too. And I would also like to say that during his day, Professor um, Lane, who has spent his life doing research on memory and emotion of the brain, is working and is affiliated with the Uh, Department of Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis of the Medical University of Vienna. And I'm happy that the head of the department, Professor Stefan Döring, who is uh, a psychoanalyst, member of the Vienna Psycholytic Society, also a member of our supervisory board, is also here tonight. He will introduce Lane, Mr. <laughs> so, Professor Lane later and uh, will moderate the discussion. So, one. <laughs> One very last remark. When I reread um, the title of your talk, Richard, um, I thought that Enduring Legacy of Freud, the 21st century, that this is also a good description of what we are doing here in the museum. Mm -hmm. As a museum, we are by definition a memory place, a lieu de mémoire, but always, of course, also with the mission of um, bringing and keeping Freud alive um, and showing us our visitors and guests why and how Freud is still re re relevant today, be it in art, be it in queer theory, be it in everyday life, or be it in neuroscience. Thank you so much. And now I give the word to Helen. It's a pleasure to be here at the beginning of a journey of a court of 16 scholars, US scholars coming to Austria, and especially you, Richard, to the Sigmund Freud Museum. Um, the, we have a long-standing partnership with the Sigmund Freud Museum. So the Fulbert Commission in Austria, Fulbert Austria is proud to have this long-lasting relation, which allows us to bring one American each year to this wonderful museum. And these talks here, these this Freud talks, I would say, here at the museum, are always a very emotional element of the Fulbert year, especially for me as well, because I remember when I was a kid about this, this, this size, yeah, entering the museum with the Kinderferienspiel at that time, and at that time it looked totally different. And somehow this, this kind of emotional connection to the museum still exists for me at least and for many other children and um, scholars coming to the museum. We see that it evolves, it, uh, it changed, it on prices, it's an amazing museum. I hope you all enjoyed it already. Our Fulbrighters had the chance to join it and see what has changed over the years. And somehow I'm really looking forward to learn from you, Richard, about emotions and the link to this place. And so I'm happy to now hand over the microphone to uh, Stefan for the introduction. And I'm hoping you enlighten us all with your wonderful remarks on the Sigmund Freud lecture here in the museum. So with this, I hand it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, 
Herman, and thank you to you for inviting us to be co-host with you and to host wonderful Richard Lane. Um, it's a pleasure for me to say hello to everybody. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you our dear colleague, guest and friend, Professor Richard Lane. He is a Fulbright Fellow, we already heard this, but many of you might not know that this is one of the most honorable awards in the world that's given to the United States' most distinguished researchers to present, to represent their home country in the world. And I, I felt it is most striking that 53 of these Fulbright Fellows were awarded the Nobel Prize later in their lives. So, okay, let's see. <laughs> Richard Lane is a medical doctor, a psychiatrist with a PhD in psychology, precisely in cognitive neuroscience. His dissertational thesis is entitled Functional Neuroanatomy of Pleasant and Unpleasant Emotion. He's a professor of psychiatry, psychology, and neuroscience at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. He published more than 200 scientific articles, almost 40 book chapters, and two seminal books. One is called Cognitive Neuroscience of Emotion, and the latest one, which I can highly recommend to you, Neuroscience of Enduring Change, Implications for Psychotherapy. And of course, you received a list of numerous awards, which I'm not going to read to you now. <laughs> Beyond these mere numbers, let me tell you that Richard Lane really is an outstanding scholar in the field. When I grew up academically, his name was known to everybody for his contribution to the science of emotion, psychosomatic medicine, and neurosciences. He invented the so-called levels of emotional awareness scale, the LEAS in German, which is well established throughout the scientific world. A few of my colleagues went to Arizona, one of them is here, um, um, to work with Richard Lane and came back so enriched with a bunch of publications that within a few years they were appointed at university as chairs. So that's also <laughs> great expectation for you. <laughs> All of my colleagues from different countries envy me for having Richard Lane at our department and here at the Sigmund Freud Museum for four months. Richard Lane's, Richard Lane's recent research focuses mainly on the question how does psychotherapy in general and psychoanalysis in particular work? He brings together his neuroscientific research and knowledge about memories and emotions with his clinical understanding of psychoanalysis. The result is a thrilling model of change that considers the activation of emotions that are, sometimes unconsciously, connected to memories as crucial for psychotherapeutic change. This specific activation within the treatment process is what Richard Lane considers crucial for memory reconsolidation, which stands for a new organization of memories from the past that, as a consequence, allows for behavior change. Before I conclude and hand over to Richard Lane, let me invite you to join his seminar at the Medical University that is open to students and professionals from different fields connected to psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Under the heading of Memory, Emotion and the Neuroscience of Enduring Change, Implications for Psychoanalysis, he will teach and discuss with us on Tuesday and optionally on Wednesday in addition from 4.30 to 6 p.m. how psychoanalysis works. We would be happy to have you there. I have an outline of his course here, so after the presentation you may have a look at the details. And uh, now, Richard, the floor is yours and we are eager to hear your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that very touching introduction. I mean, um, it almost brought tears to my eyes, which is very unusual for an introduction. I'm, I'm just so touched. Um, so, so kind of, what? You can't hear me. Can you hear me now? Okay. 
Well, I was just telling Stefan how touched I was, uh, how the uh, introduction brought tears to my eyes. Um, and I want to thank you so much for being my ap academic host and collaborator during this fellowship. Um, I want to thank Daniela Finzi and the Freud Museum staff for creating this fellowship and hosting this inaugural event. I want to thank Herman Agus and the Fulbright Commission for partnering in the fellowship. Being a Fulbright Fellow is a tremendous honor, as we've heard, <laughs> as this program is funded by the U.S. government and I am an academic ambassador representing my country. It's reminiscent of my experience 25 years ago when I spent a year in London learning functional neuroimaging at the world's leading laboratory at the time, also funded by a grant from the U.S. government. It's difficult for me to express how honored I feel to be here tonight, at this time, and on this occasion. As I walked to the museum the other day to meet with Daniela, I had the following thought. This is like going to Mount Sinai, where the Ten Commandments were delivered. <laughs> uh, indeed, growing up, Freud was kind of a godlike figure in our home, as my father was trained in psychoanalysis at the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis in the late 1950s and he went on to practice psychoanalysis for the remainder of his career. So in some ways I feel like I've been preparing for tonight's talk my whole life. <laughs> um, at this point, I'd like to give you an overview of my talk and then tell you a bit more about my background. After a few words about myself, I will talk briefly about the state of psychoanalysis and um, the challenges that it faces and kind of putting the present work in context. The bulk of my talk will be uh, on the topics of memory, emotion, and their interaction. I should explain that systems neuroscience um, is what I got my PhD in, that's cognitive neuroscience. That refers to kind of the brain basis of complex cognitive and emotional functions that are mediated by complex networks across the brain. It's different from more molecular and genetic uh, molecular neuroscience. It's a different level of organization. But the advantage is that I mean, it, it deals with topics like memory, emotion, perception, attention, etc. And it really maps on more closely to phenomenology. Okay, so therefore it, it links more directly to clinical phenomena. I'm sorry, I, it's so low. Oh, you can't hear. really hear? I, I cannot hear. I, you, you spoke better with the other microphone. You. Is that true for everyone? Or maybe I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> because um, the, other, the other microphone is just so loud that um, it will be very distracting. Is it's this better, better now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, yes. good. Yes. All right, so it'll be a long introduction to then tell you, it's, it's kind of the background to explain the course that I'll be teaching. And so I will, at, with this background, you'll now understand why I'm teaching the course that I am. And basically, it's 12 sessions to unpack everything I'm going to tell you tonight. <laughs> um, the fellowship also involves half my time doing research, and I'm going to talk about three research proje projects that I'll be involved in while I'm here. And last but not least, I want to emphasize the importance of dialogue and the exchange of ideas. This is foundational to what the Fulbright Fellowship is all about, right? Here I am coming from the U.S. to uh, share a perspective and have an exchange, okay, <laughs> with colleagues here. But it's also very important from the standpoint of psychoanalysis, because this is a somewhat different perspective. It's what Freud dreamed of, but it's not the way clinical psychoanalysis is conceptualized and practiced. So I'm very much looking for the dialogue, feedback, and reactions to what I'm going to be presenting. OK, well, with regard to my background, 
Uh, I'm going to touch on a, a few points uh, on each of these bullet points. Okay, so with regard to my early upbringing, growing up with a psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst's father, there was a lot of psychoanalytic talk in the house. And one example that stands out was when I was 12 years old, I was uh, been at a friend's house and his sister had dyed her hair. And I came home and mentioned this and my father's comment was, well, she must be unhappy with herself. And that was kind of puzzling for me as a 12 year old to kind of figure out what that meant. <laughs> okay, um, moving on. Uh, as an undergraduate, I went to Yale and was a psychology major. And um, my sophomore year, I took a senior seminar in Freudian theory and read all of Freud's major papers. Interestingly, my term paper was on the Schraber case. It was a 50-page term paper, and I loved it. Uh, this is Freud's case of paranoia. Interestingly, his, his theory was that it, paranoia was due to repressed homosexuality. Interestingly, the following year, the American Psychiatric Association determined that homosexuality was no longer a mental disorder. As a senior, I took a graduate course in Freudian theory and again read all Freud's major papers uh, and a few additional ones. Um, but all of that happened 50 years ago. Um, I went to medical school intending to become a psychiatrist at the University of Illinois, and I developed a fascination with how psychological stress could influence the course of physical disease. And it was at that point, 45 years ago, that I determined that emotion was the key to understanding this relationship. And emotion has been my guiding star in my professional career ever since. I returned to Yale for my residency in psychiatry, and I had every intention of becoming a psychoanalyst. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, once I started formal psychiatry training, I started with an analysis with a training analyst, trying to get a head start. And I wanted a good general psychiatric education, uh, but my primary goal was to excel as a psychodynamic psychotherapist. I was fortunate to, um, then I had this burning interest in emotion, I was fortunate to get a research fellowship, but interestingly I wanted to stay in New Haven because I wanted to continue my analysis, which I was enjoying. And um, it was at that point where we developed, finished the theory of emotional awareness and at a critical early conversation I had with my mentor at the time, Gary Schwartz, he really startled me in the following way. He says, okay, now we have the theory, now we have to see if it's true. So we have to create a scale to measure it. And that was a little mind boggling for me <laughs> that the theory was not enough. <laughs> um, well, during this fellowship, I also became fascinated with the brain basis of emotion. And at that time, um, psychoanalysis was already starting to decline in popularity. And I wondered if I could really have a career as a psychoanalyst. Was it worth getting the psychoanalytic training? Um, and one of the outcomes of my analysis was to decide not to become a psychoanalyst, but rather to get advanced research training to kind of pursue these same interests from a slightly different angle. And I was fortunate to get uh, a scientist development award from the National Institutes of Health that gave me five years of funding to get research training um, in an area of special interest to me, which was functional neuroimaging and uh, imaging of emotion and uh, doing emotion research more generally. And it's important to point out that I got this training after I was already on the faculty and about to get tenure. Um, so my research interests have been very, very much uh, determined by my clinical mm -hmm. observations to begin with. And then ever since then, 
there's been this wonderful dialogue <laughs> in my mind and with people who, are, who I am willing to listen uh, <laughs> between the basic science of the clinical phenomena and the clinical practice. And the clinical practice informs questions that then feed back on the research. And so I've really been very, very fortunate to have this career as a, as a researcher doing imaging on emotion and emotions and health. Uh, but also seeing patients myself um, and teaching and supervising psychodynamic psychotherapy, you know, all through the lens of this neuroscientific understanding. And that's where this work tonight that I'm going to tell you about comes from. This is my father, um, passed away in, in 2010. Uh, he was a very thoughtful person and liked to share his wisdom with others. <laughs> uh, he was also a very highly regarded teacher and supervisor of psychotherapy at Northwestern University in Chicago, and did that for many years. Um, my father's mentor was Roy Grinker. Uh, Roy Grinker founded the Institute for Psychosomatic and Psychiatric Research and Training at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago. I just happened to be born at Michael Reese Hospital, and I remember very well this entryway to this institute when I was eight years old, picking up my father on Sunday afternoon before we went to the ball game, and Institute for Psychosomatics and Psychiatric Research. What was psychosomatics? But this, my point is, I was exposed to these concepts at a very early age. Well, it turns out that Roy Grinker, who came from Chicago, came to Vienna and for, for psychoanalytic training and was analyzed by Freud in 1933. Um, apparently, it was only a one-year analysis. Analyses were short in those days. But I feel that by coming here tonight, uh, we're come, I've come full circle uh, because Grinker had an important influence on my dad when he was being, and here I am tonight, so I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. All right, what are the challenges facing psychoanalysis? I want to first point out that psychoanalysis is both a model of the mind and a mode of treatment. And I think that as a model of the mind, it's had a tremendous influence on our intellectual history, on the arts, the sciences, and I think there's no question that that will last, you know, as far as we can foresee. But with regard to a mode of treatment, I think it's threatened. And that's what this is all about. Um, and I'm not going to be trying to develop a whole model of the mind. I'm really focused on how does change occur. So this is, these are points taken from Peter Fonagy, you know, who's a professor uh, in, at University College London. Uh, from years ago, 20 years ago, but these points still hold. The fact is, is that insurers prize brief structured interventions that are cost effective. Uh, symptom change is how our diagnostic system is defined, and it's the clinical endpoint that clinicians are looking at, right, for success. Symptom change is only a small part of what psychoanalysis is after, so it's, there's a kind of mismatch there. I, I can also say, once the symptoms have been resolved, now we want to get to the root cause of what the symptoms were, and that takes longer. Um, teaching psychoanalysis is challenging due to the plethora of ideas. There are many different schools of thought within psychoanalysis that have emerged for good reasons, but they're not all internally consistent and compatible, which makes it challenging to convey to trainees what is psychoanalysis. Countertransference is extremely important clinically. It's in some ways the, the key to understanding what is happening with this person and maybe why they have the difficulty that they do with other people, but it limits the analyst's role as an objective researcher. 
in fact. Um, according to Fanaghi, a genuine, objective research tradition has been lacking in psychoanalysis. And for many years, empirical research was rejected because it was, number one, thought to not be necessary, but also that it really would interfere with the subtleties of the process and wasn't worth the effort. But unfortunately, we live in a world where that can't be avoided now. Moreover, psychoanalysis has always thought to develop a comprehensive, sought to develop a comprehensive model of the mind. And if you're doing that, you must be open to other perspectives, right? And neuroscience is certainly very relevant. Well, Freud's dream, in fact, was to develop a brain-based understanding of the mind. And here are some quotes from Freud. Here's from 2014. We must Huh? 1914. Ah, okay, sorry, thank you. <laughs> we must recollect that our provisional ideas in psychology will presumably someday be based on an organic substructure. We are taking this probability into account in replacing the special chemical substances by special psychical forces. The deficiencies in our description would probably vanish if we were already in a position to replace the psychological terms by physiological or chemical ones. Okay, and another one in 1920. Biology is truly a land of unlimited possibilities. We may expect it to give us the most surprising information, and we cannot guess what answers it will return in a few dozen years to the questions we have put to it, and that was a century ago. So, I want to introduce the idea of mechanisms by showing you this beautiful picture of our wonderful sunsets in Tucson, Arizona. We live in the Sonoran Desert, and these, you see the beautiful uh, saguaro cacti, which are only found in this part of the world. Well, this is a sunset, and the, you see the sun setting in the west, right? But is, is that what's happening? Is the sun actually setting in the west? Why does the sun disappear over the horizon in the evening? <laughs> well, consider the possibility that the sun actually sets in the west. That's consistent with Aristotle's view of the universe, which is that everything revolves around the earth and the sun is, is setting, right? As it revolves around the earth. But we know that that's not the case, thanks to Copernicus. In fact, the Earth is rotating around the Sun, and it appears to set in the West because the Earth is rotating on its axis. Now, the point is that to the human eye, these two mechanisms look identical. Right? But the mechanism underlying the phenomenology matters a lot. So once we understand the mechanisms, uh, whole new worlds open up uh, when the mechanisms are understood. And so going back to Isaac Newton, right, 350 years of development leading to the Hubble telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope. And so we're getting very good at observing the external world. <laughs> what about the internal world? I think we may be, by analogy, closer to Galileo, um, who pioneered the use of the telescope. Okay, we've had, can you hear me? Yeah. We have um, functional neuroimaging now for about 40 years, and we've learned a lot of things, but I think it's still in its infancy. But just imagine, hard to imagine, how much we'll learn as things develop over the next 100, 200, 300 years, right? Okay, so this brings me to um, our attempt to define mechanisms of change in psychotherapy. Title, uh, this paper was published in 2015 and it was published in Behavioral and Brain Sciences, which is a really top-notch neuroscience journal with a high impact factor. 
and it was really very challenging to get this paper accepted. And once we achieved that, we really felt that we had something. So, um, my co-authors in this paper, first of all, were two memory researchers at the University of Arizona. Lynn Nadell, who's now Emeritus Professor, has really been at the forefront of memory research for the past 40, 50 years. And he's really a central figure in our changing understanding that memories are not fixed, but are modifiable. Lee Ryan is our current head of the Department of Psychology at the University of Arizona, and she does fMRI research on memory. And her work was critical in demonstrating that episodic memories or personal experiences and semantic memory or generalizable knowledge are really highly interrelated in the brain. They're not as separate as we once thought. And I'll say more about that. The fourth author was Les Greenberg from Toronto, a clinical psychologist who invented emotion-focused psychotherapy. And he's written 20 books on the topic and has done extensive research on the importance of emotion and emotion processing in psychotherapy. Um, also have to thank the six anonymous reviewers. When we, after submitting the paper, we got back 14 single-space pages of comments, uh, which was unbelievable. And these, these reviewers knew at least as much as we did about what we were talking about. And so, you know, we really felt like by responding effectively to them, we had something. Um, and so, essentially, this, this paper, and I'll tell you what the basic concepts of it were, really only kind of scratched the surface, and we felt that there was so much more to do and explicate. So we created a conference in 2017 and invited you know, 15 speakers to who would come and speak and talk to one another and then write chapters. And we published this book in 2020, and um, yeah. And this book is the basis for the course that I'll be teaching. The first part of the book is a chapter is on basic science of memory, emotion, their interactions, the role of sleep that I'll tell you about. The, the second section is approaching, talking about different psychotherapy modalities, including psychodynamic psychotherapy from a memory reconsolidation standpoint. And then we have summary chapters, including uh, chapter on computational mechanisms, as well as defining the research agenda of both basic and clinical research. And that was really a primary goal for this book, to define the research agenda. Okay, we said in our 2015 paper that there are three essential ingredients for enduring change in psychotherapy. And I have to point out that this is a, an overarching theory of change that applies to all psychotherapy modalities that aspire to enduring change, okay? It happens to fit psychoanalysis quite well. That's what I'm focusing on tonight, but it's not only intended for that. Okay, there are three essential steps. First, activate old memories and old feelings with or without awareness of their connection to the past so that if the patient has a transference response to the analyst. He may not be actively recalling the developmental antecedents, but the fact is that that memory has been activated. Okay. Second, concurrently engage new emotional experiences that change and update old memories through reconsolidation by transforming and expanding the emotional content. And then third, to reinforce the strength of the new memories and their semantic structures by practicing new ways of behaving and experiencing the world in a variety of contexts. One of the original aspects of this paper was that we proposed the integrated memory model, which says that these three entities episodic memories, which is personal experiences, such as my speaking to you here tonight, uh, semantic structures, generalizable knowledge, the Freud Museum and my concept of the Freud Museum, and then 
uh, emotional responses, arousal, action, and feeling. It's impossible to activate one without the others. So I have visited the Freud Museum every time I've been to Vienna starting in 1982, and I've always been an outsider. But here I am tonight speaking to you, and I'm part of the program, and it's very emotionally meaningful to me, and it is changing my concept of the Freud Museum. Okay. Um, these same principles apply to psychotherapy. Uh, because in psychotherapy, we think that the recurrent patterns that people have can be thought of as semantic structures or schematic memories. I'll say more about this. And that episodic memories, the experiences in therapy and analysis will update those semantic structures. It's important for you to understand that semantic knowledge or concepts are a distillation of episodic experiences, the common features, right? So let's take this example of a little child who goes to the park with his parents and sees a bunch of animals. Well, one is a robin, medium-sized, red. It's got feathers, wings, a beak, and can fly. She's, she sees dogs and cats, but then sees another creature that's yellow and small, but also has feathers, wings, beak, and can fly. And over time, the child develops a concept of a bird, right? It's a distillation of those experiences. Well, how does this apply to what we're interested in clinically in psychoanalysis? Well, growing up, relevant features of recurring situations are extracted, including who's involved, what transpires, how it feels, how, how you're taught to respond, and how others respond to you. These memories are the elements of the internal working model of how the world of object relations operates. Okay? And that's what is the source of the problem, and that's what we're trying to change. Let me give you an example on one slide of the current maladaptive pattern and its treatment. <laughs> um, the case of Becky, uh, this is a treatment provided by Hannah Levinson, a clinical psychologist from Oakland, California, who is a specialist and has developed time-limited dynamic psychotherapy, and this is a treatment of um, a woman named Becky in her mid-20s. Um, six sessions, and it was all recorded start to finish on a video put out by the American Psychological Association. By the way, Hannah Levinson is going to be here uh, in Vienna the last week of June, and uh, Stefan During has arranged for her to give a talk to the, what, the Austrian Psychodynamic Psychotherapy Society, is that what it's called? Ökert. Try to repeat. <laughs> the Austrian uh, psych, uh, Psychodynamic <laughs> Psychotherapy. <laughs> okay. Whatever. Okay. Um, she'll be here for the talk on June 29th. <laughs> She's giving a talk herself that week. Right. Becky, uh, mother... Becky's mother was alcohol dependent and required that Becky attend to mother's needs. Okay. Father was very demanding and expected top performance. So Becky became perfectionistic and learned not to impose her needs on others. Now she had a boyfriend and she loved him very much, but he was often inconsiderate. So she kept her feelings to herself and often cried herself to sleep. Therapy involved paying attention to her emotional pain, recognizing her needs that were unmet, coming to feel that she was worthy of being treated well by virtue of the interaction that she had with Dr. Levinson. And then as a result, taking action in her relationships to increase the likelihood that her needs would be met. Okay? It was a six session treatment. It turned out that there was a five year follow up, and it turned out that things continued to improve. Okay, well, how can we relate this to Freud's approach to treatment? Well, we go back to 1895, 
And this was his original model of change, and it evolved over time, but useful to look at the original model. Trauma memories and their associated affects that remained unconscious were the problem. That is, they were the source of the symptoms or dysfunction. The analyst's job was to facilitate overcoming the patient's resistance to enable recall of the memory and the affect. And the curative aspect was to experience and express the affect that had been pent up, assuming that catharsis was the mechanism of cure. Okay? So, how does this relate to Becky? Well, she did have traumatic experiences and she had pent up emotions related to the messages that it wasn't okay for her to express her feelings and her needs. The analyst, the psychotherapist, actually facilitated her conscious recall of these memories and the associated feelings, okay? But experience and expressing the affect wasn't enough. Interestingly, our three ingredients of change, the first one corresponds extremely well to what Freud said. So, it's not so much incorrect, but incomplete. Because we have to concurrently engage new emotional experiences that change the old memories through reconsolidation by transforming and expanding the emotional content to get the feeling that it was okay for her to express her feelings and her needs. And if she happened to be rejected, that would be okay because she really deserved to be treated well. Then to keep doing this with her boyfriend and with other people, to reinforce the strength of the new memories and the semantic structures by practicing new ways of behaving and experiencing the world in a variety of contexts. So, point is, this isn't that far from what Freud said, uh, but it's an elaboration. Well, I've put a lot of emphasis on memory reconsolidation because lo and behold, Sigmund Freud was the first person to describe what we now call memory reconsolidation. And he called it retranscription. He says the material present, and this is in a letter to Fleece in 1896, the material present in the form of memory traces being subjected from time to time to a rearrangement in accordance with fresh circumstances, to a retranscription. Thus what is essentially new about my theory is the thesis that memory is present not once but several times over, that it is laid down in various kinds of indications. Now I'm going to take you through a rodent experiment a century later, in the year 2000, that finally convinced the scientific community <laughs> that memory reconsolidation happens. Okay? So we had the theory described a century before, but you needed this kind of evidence. <clears throat> okay. We'll start off with the background information that protein synthesis is necessary for memory reconsolidation. By the way, this work was done in the laboratory of Joseph Ledoux in New York. Kareem Nader was the uh, first author, an experimenter, and Joe Ledoux is like the premier uh, emotion neuroscientist in the world with memory emotion interactions. Okay. Protein synthesis is necessary for memory consolidation. Okay, so um, we have a short-term memory, and when it gets converted to long-term memory, that's consolidation. Memory reconsolidation is that when that memory, in long-term memory, gets reactivated, it can be revised and reconsolidated, and this study demonstrates this. So. This paper is about protein synthesis necessary for reconsolidation after retrieval. Okay, I don't know if you can see it, but rats were conditioned by pairing a tone here uh, with a foot shock. Okay. Then you wait 24 hours for a night of sleep and for protein synthesis to occur. It's important. Then, 24 hours later, you ring the tone again, which has not been conditioned, it's the conditioned stimulus, and that causes the rats to freeze. 
Okay? And so these are these dark bars here, high levels of freezing. If you just present the tone without pairing it with the shock, it doesn't cause freezing. Okay? Next, there's this drug called anisomycin, which blocks protein synthesis. You can inject it directly into the amygdala where this learning is happening. If you inject anisomycin after the learning has occurred down here, it, it doesn't alter the freezing. However, if you do what's shown here, where you present the tone first and then present and then inject the anisomycin, then the freezing disappears. In other words, reactivation of the memory, the condition stimulus only, puts the memory in a labile state. Injection of a protein synthesis inhibitor into the amygdala then erased the memory. So the conclusion is that we now think that whenever memories are retrieved, they're available for updating and then reconsolidated with new information presented when they're in the labile state. Okay. So before I got involved in memory, I didn't really think that much about it. Memory, of course, is a record of the past. But it's really not just for recalling the past, it's a guide to the future. Memory is adaptive because it keeps a record of what did and didn't work in the past. And the key benefit is that it serves as a guide to similar situations in the future. Now, um, in fact, the brain, excuse me, is constantly making predictions about what's happening now and likely to happen in the near future based on these memories. We now understand that the brain is a predictive organ and it's much more computationally efficient to make predictions about what's gonna happen and then fine tune those predictions with sensory data rather than computing the perception from scratch. Okay. So having some capacity to update memories in light of changing circumstances can optimize adaptive flexibility, but changes must be made prudently. And I think this model of schematic memories or semantic memories as a distillation of episodic experiences that can be updated is gives you some idea of what's involved in updating that accumulated knowledge and memory. Can everybody see this? Okay. I want you to, it's a little bit like a Rorschach ink blot. Um, I'm going to give you a few seconds, and if anybody can tell me what this is, raise your hand. <laughs> Julian and I had a little conversation about this. Uh, and he had some ideas. They weren't correct, by the way, Julian. <laughs> if you have other ideas, let me know. All right. Um, anybody see anything here? It's kind of hard. All right. Now, let me ask you this. Is it that you, you know what it is, but you're just having trouble putting it into words? Or do you just you don't know what it is, and therefore you couldn't possibly describe it, right? OK. <laughs> All right, now let's look at these side by side. All right, um, can you, oh, I'm sorry. Can you look at this now and not remember what you just saw? The, you know, the point here is the power of predictive processing, the role of expectations and pre-existing knowledge in perception, okay? And this came from this wonderful book uh, by Anil Seth on the New Science of Consciousness, which is a computational approach to consciousness. I highly recommend. He's at the University of Sussex. Okay, well, feelings and emotions. We talked about memory. Freud said it's not easy to deal with feelings scientifically. And I would submit that a predictive processing computational approach is highly relevant. <laughs> okay, we We've learned a lot about emotion in the past century. Uh, for one, emotional arousal interacts with memory in important ways. It enhances memory encoding. We know that synaptic plasticity 
which is the molecular basis for encoding memories and involves protein synthesis, is enhanced by the neurotransmitters and hormones, norepinephrine and cortisol, that are activated by emotional arousal. We also know that emotional arousal is necessary for therapeutic change uh, in a variety of modalities. High physiological arousal during exposure therapy is a predictor of its effectiveness. Multiple studies of emotion-focused psychotherapy by Les Greenberg and others show that in-session arousal at a moderate level is associated with better therapy outcome. And of course, we know classically in psychodynamic psychotherapy and analysis that insight without adequate effective engagement is unlikely to produce lasting results. Okay, now I'm going to talk about Freud's concept of the unconscious. And I was, yeah, Karen and I wrote our first paper together on Freud's antiquities. And this was inspired by a visit that I made to the Freud Museum in London, um, where all of his antiquities were located, right? And so what I'm showing you is a photograph of Freud's office here in Vienna. As I understand, it was one floor below. Is that right? And I've added these the words here, the labels, so that you can't quite see the chair behind, behind the couch. But Freud was sitting there looking out, right? And he saw the table ahead of him to the right here. And then directly across from him was a display case. And he was looking at these antiquities as he was doing psychoanalysis. Why was he doing that? Well, because as he was listening to patients speak, he was thinking about what were the unconscious determinants of the conscious content that they were reporting. And he thought of those unconscious mental contents as buried treasures, fully formed, beautiful, well-articulated statues and figurines that were buried. They were covered over by defenses right, that you had to remove. And voila, out would, out would come these beautiful, well-differentiated treasures. I think that a, a more accurate model of the unconscious now is that of an unfinished statue when it comes to emotions, a body without specific face or differentiation. Okay? Now, trauma plays an important role in psychopathology, certainly in Freud's original <coughs> theories. And we now know a lot more about what happens in the brain, what happens with regard to emotions uh, in the context of trauma. Uh, the emotional and contextual encoding during trauma may be impaired. Why is that? The trauma involves being emotionally overwhelmed. The amygdala, which is a key center in the brain for emotion detection and execution, not by itself, but it plays a super important role in that. The amygdala is hyper aroused, and in trauma, the hippocampus is inhibited. Now, if the arousal level is too high, the hippocampus cannot adequately encode context. And this, can, this leads to the overgeneralized sensitivity to threat cues. So, for example, if a woman has been raped by a man, she may become fearful of all men, you know, not just ones that are, are dangerous. And because of this lack of uh, specificity, the amygdala will fire in response to relatively innocuous stimuli. Okay? Moreover, hyperarousal impairs the prefrontal cortex, and the prefrontal cortex goes offline. And as a result, encoding of specific emotions is impaired as it's mediated by the medial prefrontal cortex in interaction with the amygdala. What I'm showing here in the lower left is the famous Yerkes Dotson curve, which shows that for any complex cognitive function, performance declines at very high levels of arousal or very low levels of arousal, but you want to be in the moderate level to have optimal performance. Okay, so in trauma, you have excessively high arousal. These functions are impaired. And the point is that people 
and this is not universally true, but it's a good rule of thumb, that when it comes to trauma, people know what happened, but they don't know how they felt about it. The feelings need to be formulated for the first time. They may remember being terrified, but for example, uh, only in therapy may they get in touch with being angry about what happened, for example. And Donnell Stern in New York has written extensively about how experience is unformulated and needs to be formulated in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. I think it's important to point out that um, Freud, through his entire writings, only dealt with uh, mental contents that had been previously represented. Okay? And so this idea of dealing with unrepresented mental content is a new addition post-Freud. But Freud, as you'll see, had something to do with my way of thinking about it. Okay, classically, in psychoanalysis, when people are not in touch with feelings or ideas or thoughts, it's because they're repressed. It's because there's an active inhibitory process, right? And what I'm, one of the things I've tried to do is extend this idea to include deficits. And a way of thinking about deficits is to think about your repertoire of emotion concepts and words. How extensive is your repertoire? And we can make the analogy to your Crayola boxes. Do you have a little small one? I mean, we see patients who are really very impaired in their ability to describe what they're feeling. I mean, good and bad is oftentimes what they can say. Uh, only a handful of emotions, and they have difficulty really accessing how they're feeling in the moment. I think that most people in this room would have a very large uh, collection of <laughs> words and concepts available to you, and that's you're able to be articulate about how you feel in a differentiated manner. And an important point is that it's not just a simple readout of what you're feeling, it's constitutive of the experience. Having the words really makes a difference in terms of what you're actually feeling. And this has been I guess, best described most recently by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who's uh, <clears throat> at Boston University. <clears throat> This, I think this book came out in 2017, and she talks about emotional feelings are constructed. We have bodily responses, the physiological activation and the action tendencies, but differentiated feelings are based on concepts and the use of language, okay? Mm -hmm. And that language helps constitute the experience. And I can illustrate it here with this slide from Les Greenberg that an emotional response that you have in the moment is a bodily felt reference, it's what you experience, it's the lived story. But when you put it into words, you're creating a mental representation of it, it's the told story explaining what you feel. And this is a bi-directional relationship here. So when you put something into words, it really shifts what you feel in your body, and then you can continue to describe what that is with an additional mental representation, and that's how you get more differentiated, complex descriptions of emotional experience. And this is the basis of the cognitive developmental approach to emotional awareness that uh, Stefan mentioned. Um, and we've created the Levels of Emotional Awareness Scale, and there are now 230 papers um, showing that there's something to it. Uh, emotional responses start in the body consisting of physiological activation and action tendencies. An action tendency like wanting to withdraw from something or approach it. When these bodily responses are conceptualized and put into words, the feelings become more differentiated and specific. Over time, one's repertoire and the ability to experience a combination of feelings increases. This ability can be measured with the levels of emotional awareness scale. And an automated version of the LES in German now exists 
And Julian Hertz is here in the audience. He uh, came to Tucson you know, last spring, and we worked together the past year, and he's developed uh, a very functional German version. It was not easy, and we're going to be using that in our research, as I'll tell you. So thank you, Julian. It's great to have you here. <laughs> All right. Uh, is alexithymia an anomia or agnosia? Uh, do these words mean anything to anyone here? <laughs> okay. Um, that's the question. Okay, alexithymia. So I mentioned that people who've had a lot of early life trauma don't know what they're feeling. And it was observed that you, you'd ask these people, how are you feeling about this, this conflict you're having in your relationship? I don't know. Uh, I feel bad. Okay. So is it, literally this term means lacking words for emotion. Okay. Now in neurology, we have this distinction between an anomia and an agnosia. An anomia, you know what an object is, but you can't name it. An agnosia, you can't recognize the object and therefore you can't name it. So, we'll look at this picture here. Uh, do you know what it is? Uh, it's a musical instrument. You know what it sounds like. You know that Stevie Wonder played it, Bob Dylan, the Beatles, right? You can hear it. You may not be able to think of the word, but you know what it is, right? Somebody who can't recognize it, at all, when I say something with teeth, okay, they have no idea. So it's a recognition failure. The perception is intact. You can see the whole thing. But it results from a breakdown in the link between perception of an object and stored knowledge about it. Now think back to when you first saw this picture, right? Did you know what it was, but couldn't name it? Or did you not know what it was, and therefore couldn't name or describe it, okay? Probably the latter, right? Which would be corresponding to an agnosia. I think clinic, this is a very important distinction clinically. I think many patients with early life trauma really have no clue, and this is when, when they think, look inside to describe how they're feeling, it's, it's a mess. Mm -hmm. Sigmund Freud. The neurologist in 1891 was the first person to describe agnosia. <clears throat> For disturbances in the recognition of objects, which Finkelberg called asymbolia, I should like to propose the term agnosia. This is a very important distinction because asymbolia is the same as anomia. Okay? So you have your perceptual stimulus, the object, the harmonica. You know what it sounds like, and you have the word harmonica, but in between there's that mental representation of what it is. In the domain of emotion, the perceptual stimulus is interceptive. It's that bodily, physiological, behavioral, emotional response. And so we wrote this paper also in 2015 with the following title, Effective Agnosia, Expansion of the Alexithymia Construct and a New Opportunity to Integrate and Extend Freud's Legacy. Now, Freud didn't apply agnosia to psychoanalysis, um, and certainly not to emotion, but it's a critical concept. The idea is, in effect of agnosia, a failure to mentally represent a bodily emotional response is associated with deficits, not just in describing one's own emotions, but also in experiencing and knowing what you're feeling. And this is clinically important because patients who don't know what they're feeling will often present with a lot of somatic symptoms and not be able to link it to the stress that they have in their lives, for example, and many other applications. All right, the introduction is over. Now I'm going to tell you about the course. <laughs> All right, so starting next Tuesday, we're going to start with the... 2015 paper, the BBS paper, Memory Consolidation, Emotional Arousal, and the Process of Enduring Change. Um, we'll then talk in the session, second session about a chapter that I wrote on recurrent maladaptive patterns. Okay, that, that's what we're trying to change, these schematic memories. 
Session three will go into detail, the basic science of different kinds of memory and the interactions between memory and emotion. As I alluded to, consolidation and reconsolidation happen when you're sleeping. So uh, when I first heard about this, I mentioned to somebody who's working in the area, and I said, well, maybe we should have people take a nap after a psychotherapy session. Ha ha ha. Well, in fact, it was no joke. She thought that's really a good idea, actually. Why is that? When you activate a memory, the uh, reconsolidation window stays open for six hours. You have a one-hour session, and we just think, well, I'll see you tomorrow, and there's going to be continuity. We don't think about what happens for the next five hours. It's very relevant, actually, okay? And so um, it really, as you can see, it just opens up all these different possibilities when you have this new perspective, right? So um, session four will be about sleep dreaming and memory reconsolidation. I will add that um, emotional memories are reconsolidated during REM sleep when most dreaming happens. Session five, the unconscious embodied emotion and the neural basis of emotional experience. <clears throat> For those of you familiar with this area, you know that um, Yak Pengsup uh, has a different model. He, he is more traditional and believes that there are specific neural circuits for specific categories of emotion. And um, he and Mark, Mark Solms created the, the field of neuropsychoanalysis in 1999. And I'm so honored, actually, that the Neuropsychoanalysis Association is posting uh, the uh, lectures that I'm going to be giving on their website, okay? So we are friends, but uh, we have differing views on the neural basis of emotional experience and its clinical implications. And thanks to Stefan and Manfred Boydel, uh, the first week of May at the uh, German College of Psychosomatic Medicine, Mark Solms and I are going to have a plenary session for just the two of us are talking about our different models of the neural basis of emotional experience and its clinical implications. He's a master debater and encyclopedic knowledge of Freud, but I'm, I'm going to try to hold my own. <laughs> okay, session six, emotional awareness, evolution, development, and consequences of trauma. Only human beings are aware of their own emotions, okay? And that's because we have that capability because of the expansion of our brains. But that doesn't enable us to automatically be aware of our emotions. It requires certain kind of developmental experiences, attunement, empathy, contingent responding, etc. And with trauma, that development doesn't happen as well. That's session six. Okay, session seven, the dynamic conscious Unconscious, revisited. What? Short on time. Short on time? Okay. We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> um, dynamic unconscious revisited. This is going to be an attempt to integrate both the defense and deficit model within a computational perspective. We talk about the clinical expression of impaired emotional awareness. Session nine, treatment implications of this model, the importance of corrective emotional experiences and corrective emotional relationships, research implications. Session 11, June 13th, the research findings during this fellowship. And finally, the place of psych psychoanalysis in relation to other psychotherapy modalities. <clears throat> With regard to that, here is a quote from our 2015 paper that was caught the attention of Mariana Luisinger, Luisinger Bolivar, who was uh, managing director of the Freud Institute in Frankfurt between 2002 and 2016. Time and cost considerations aside, the technique of meeting three, four, or five times per week for several years creates a special opportunity to activate old memories and observe their influence on present-day construals and emotional experiences with emotional intensity and vividness it's difficult or impossible with other methods. As such, this approach has the potential to offer something not available with other modalities. 
Mariana had a, has a particular interest in the use of dreams as a psychoanalytic treatment outcome variable, okay? But adding this perspective about memory reconsolidation makes it especially interesting because not only consolidation, but we think reconsolidation of emotional memories happens during REM sleep and dreaming. Manifest dream content may be a real-time readout of reconsolidation as it's happening. And this is a fresh take on dreams following Freud's seminal book in 1900 on the interpretation of dreams. The hypothesis is that changes over time in manifest dream content may be an index of memory reconsolidation processes related to treatment. Variables that may change include the dreamer's position, whether it's a detached observer or an engaged participant, the sense of agency, whether an initiator of events or a passive participant, emotional engagement with others, or lack thereof in the dream, the range of emotions, as well as resilience, positive as well as negative emotions. We thought it would be useful to look at dreams in a clinical sample, <clears throat> but also early trauma memories. As Mariana is overseeing a study, multi-center study in the EU, of patients with depression and early childhood adversity, comparing high frequency four to five times per week psychoanalysis to once a week psychoanalysis, okay? And these patients will be compared to 15 to 30 patients currently being treated with emotion-focused psychotherapy in Europe and 15 to 30 controls, and will be obtaining childhood trauma memories and dream reports pre-treatment and one year later and correlated with clinical improvement. Our prediction is that memories, dreams, and clinical status will improve together. During this fellowship, we're going to develop coding systems applicable to both, applicable both to the childhood memories and dream reports. We'll develop the coding system during this fellowship in preparation for data analysis later this year. Okay. Am I, do I have a few more minutes? Um, or? It's 8, 18. Right, we started at 7, 15, so uh, <laughs> that's the problem. It's perfect. Should I keep going? There are two more studies to tell you about. Um, okay, so uh, four years ago, we sat down and we thought, okay, how can we really test this idea of memory reconsolidation? If the problem is the internal working model of the social world, how can we evaluate that and look at the effect of emotion updating of this internal working model? And so Lynn Nadell pointed out work done in New York by Daniela Schiller and her colleagues at Mount Sinai, paper published in 2015. And what they did was they um, <coughs> created a video game that people would play and it was structured so that you could map how a person is functioning with regard to two major dimensions of social interaction, power, dominance, or, and affiliation. Okay? And this was published in a leading neuroscience journal because they were able to have people play the game in the scanner and show that the hippocampus is tracking this um, basically social map. So it involves things like an interaction like this. A person comes to town, a new town, and they need to find a job and they need to find a place to live. So the boss says, I need you to stay later. We need to have it ready in two days. And you have a choice. Do you say, well, whatever you need, boss. Or do you say, I'm putting my best efforts in this project. Can I get paid over time? Okay. And so you can track where people are on this two-dimensional surface. And the hippocampus is tracking that. So this is, um, for the past three years, we've done a half dozen studies online. And we've now developed uh, an elaboration of this where we're now 
introducing new emotional information. You establish on day one the network, and then somebody who's treated you badly starts to treat you nicely, they apologize, and they try to make amends. Right? Now all this is happening online in the scanner. Right? So we have demonstrated behaviorally that we can update the schema. Does this updating increase trust in the other person? We have people playing a trust game before and after, so we can objectively measure it. And we can look to see whether this updating involves interactions between the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex, where we expect this updating to happen. This is obviously in healthy subjects, but it lends itself to clinical application in individual patients if we can get it to work. And the scanning is going to be done in Lausanne in the next month or two. So in June, I might have preliminary results. Last but not least, emotional awareness and attachment style in, psych in a psychotherapy study of patients with borderline personality disorder here in Vienna. Uh, and Stefan During is in charge of the study. 92 patients with borderline personality disorder treated with transference-focused psychotherapy or treatment as usual followed up for five years. This data set is complete, so we know we're going to be able to do this. Um, emotional awareness, using Julian's method, will be assessed from the adult attachment interviews obtained at baseline and at follow-up. Independent of defenses, people vary in their capacity for emotional awareness. Okay, so. A group of borderline patients have primitive defenses, splitting, projective identification, etc. But we can assess their repertoire deficits <laughs> independently, and we think that's going to co-vary as a function of trauma and will be important clinically. Three predictions. First, higher emotional awareness at baseline, we think it will be associated with better treatment response. Second, emotional awareness increases as clinical status improves. And third, as emotional awareness increases, we believe attachment style, which is to be thought of as a type of schematic memory, becomes more secure. Conclusion. Okay. Psychoanalysis aims to provide definitive treatment of psychological difficulties by altering their root cause. Changing schematic memories through reconsolidation constitutes a mechanism for enduring change that can be empirically tested and potentially validated. By putting clinical psychoanalysis on a stronger empirical footing, its efficiency may be improved and its decline can potentially be reversed. The origins of the current work can be traced directly to Freud's own seminal discoveries in the 1890s. And success in this work would help to make Freud's dream a reality. So with that, I want to thank you for the wonderful opportunity to speak to you tonight, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, I speak loud. I guess you can, can hear. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for your wonderful talk. It's, it's so impressive to me how you connect these neuroscientific results with our clinical experience in, in the treatment room. And I'm sure we do have many questions um, addressing all these different aspects yes. you have told us. But, uh, Let's ask the audience first, are there any comments, questions you want to make? You can also, Sie können auch auf Deutsch fragen, ich würde das dann so gut es geht versuchen zu übersetzen. Thank you very much, Richard. It was really impressive. So, I'm not an analyst, psychoanalyst, but now I, I get the impression it would be best to do psychoanalysis in the evening. And ah. afterwards, <laughs> send the patient to sleep. Is this correct? Do you think, would you suggest sleeping afterwards for ah. consolidation of memory, of new memories? Uh, that's not a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think another thing that you could do also <clears throat> is a rehearsal of what you experienced early in the day before you go to sleep. That has been shown to affect 
you know, what you dream about, yeah, and what you remember. Yeah. If, if I may add, as a psychoanalyst, my experience is that the evening sessions show people who are, in a way, softened somehow, uh, opener with with less active with weaker defenses mm -hmm. so it's easier if people are tired mm -hmm. to get through this um, yeah. uh, shield of defense yes yes i i'd also add that as a psychiatrist <clears throat> it turns out that many of our commonly used medications for depression and for anxiety inhibit rem sleep Okay, and so clinically we know that if someone isn't sleeping well, we want them to sleep, right? And so we give them medication to help them sleep. But if we're also doing psychotherapy, we might be shooting ourselves in the foot by giving them medications that inhibit REM that will interfere with memory reconsolidation in psychotherapy. Yeah. I'm absolutely sure that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. What do you do with people which remember very well the traumatism of childhood and they insist on it and even if other people say they are wrong, how can you treat them? Right, that's, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, well, I think that the answer is that as, as a psychotherapist, you accept what the person says as their emotional reality and you go from there. And uh, if other people, you know, claim that it didn't happen, well, that's not the final answer either. And I think you just have to, you know, start at that point and, and not stop. Um, there is, of course, I think what you're implying and getting at is that this same mechanism that can be used for clinical benefit also leads to false memories, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think as a clinician, if you uh, have the opportunity to have some objective evidence that it's not true, then I think you can empathically, uh, with appropriate timing, mention that and see what the patient makes of that and try to go from there. What would you say? <laughs> I don't have a simple answer. <laughs> but I, maybe my question fits somehow into what you have been discussing. When I listen to you, I ask myself, how do I teach, or what do I teach to candidates, to young psychotherapists? What should they do in mm -hmm. their sessions? And I thought about what you said, that we should activate or reactivate memories and affects. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, how do we activate memories and affects in mm -hmm. the session? What, yeah. should, what should we do? Yeah. Well, see, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, in 1999, <clears throat> when I was finishing my PhD, there was a conference organized by a professor at the University of Arizona on emotional awareness, and that's where I met Les Greenberg. And Les Greenberg's whole technique has to do with activating emotion and working directly with emotion. He does not conceptualize emotions as fundamentally inhibited by defenses. He just, he makes empathic gestures, he uh, uses, you know, I statements, he resonates with the patient, he's extremely empathic, and he really tries to go for the emotional pain, and he elicits it, okay? And I think the short answer is that <clears throat> Emotion-focused therapy has wonderful techniques for activating emotions that require a deviation from traditional psychoanalytic technique, but I think that the optimal approach, in my view, is to somehow integrate what's good about psychoanalysis with the you know, memory-enhancing and activating techniques used in emotion-focused therapy. And Hannah Levinson, by the way, is especially good at this integration, and that's why I'm especially good that she's coming here to the end of June. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so undoubtedly we can find some evidence for some theories that have been put forward by Freud and, and later colleagues, um, and perhaps neuromal correlates. 
I'm curious in your opinion because there is some theorizing in the field about things that allegedly cannot be evidence based. Um, just in case I think the Oedipus complex where we cannot find really um, evidence for this. And I'm curious how you think that the field should work with, with these things and, and treat them because I do think even the clinical practice still carries um, relatively groundless theories that are, have been put forward long ago. Could you say, give me a better idea of what you're talking about with regard to non-evidence-based aspects of psychotherapy that are essential? Yeah, so um, I'm not a psychoanalyst myself, I'm just a bit familiar with theory, but um, so there's quite a lot of theorizing about this whole process. And you are or are not a psychoanalyst? I'm sorry. I, I'm not, no. no okay. Um, <laughs> just a psychologist. psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, so Freud has put forward a lot of theories, say, on childhood development, um, on how to deal with patients, and some of these things undoubtedly we can find correlates with at least. But um, I do think that there are many things in there, and I think this includes, the, for example, Oedipus complex, which, which still has been put forward, mm. and which I do think cannot be based in evidence, it cannot really be grounded. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you think how a field that's developing towards a bit more evidence-based practice, how they should deal with this, because I do understand that the field kind of carries these, these concepts with it. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, I'd make a distinction between a focus on change and how that happens and a more general model of the mind and how, you know, mental development takes place, right? I think um, I'm really trying to focus on the change process and I'm not attempting to explain everything, okay? So I think that's a beginning statement, uh, which is not to say that uh, over time, it won't be possible to, you know, address these complex concepts. Um, I mean, there are, for example, computational approaches to understanding what, what the Oedipus complex is about, you know, going from a two-person to a three-person psychology, and what are the cognitive and emotional aspects of that, and uh, contradictory emotions. I mean, it can be broken down into its cognitive and affective elements. I think that becomes more evidence-based as opposed to some of a grand um, validation or rejection of Oedipus complex per se. I can't stop to add to this answer. This is a question of epistemology. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to find evidence for the Oedipus complex? So do you want to have the rodents to show something that you can measure? Mm -hmm. And then do you have a proof for the existence, or do you want to have a heuristic understanding that creates a completely different kind of evidence? And I think if we go beyond a certain level of complexity, the rodents don't tell the truth about what we are doing with, with these patients and the complex model of the mind. And we have to switch to another epistemology. Maybe in 300 years, mm. yeah. it will be possible. So for now, I would say for clinical use, I need heuristic models of understanding what's going on in the here and now okay. between the patient and myself to be able to make use of these techniques to induce, to activate emotions and memories. So it's just a, it's a model that helps me to understand the patient. But we are far from creating empirical evidence for the truth. Right. Whatever the truth is right. of this model. And I feel it's so important to understand each other. If you are working on this empirical level, it's a much lower degree of, of complexity that we are able to, to investigate. And if you combine both, then it's really exciting. I would say. Uh, yeah, and I would add that I think that the OPD3, the Operational Psychodynamic Diagnostic System, <coughs> is a real important innovation because it defines different domains of psychopathology, conflict-based and deficit-based. And I think you're more likely to find, you know, the Oedipus complex being very relevant in a more conflict-based kind of psychopathology as opposed to more early trauma deficit-based. Well, it's, a, it's an attempt to approach this, but still there is such a gap between clinical reality and these models. But there is. There is an yeah. Another question? Um, you were talking about, uh, about, Freud, uh, about memory and affect, and how um, the solution about the consolidation, reconsolidation, and the solution um, to reconsolidate with, um, in Freud's model, this uh, catharsis, 
And since the solution, this is how it resolves in the end. And uh, it's just, uh, I thought that maybe I'm getting this uh, completely wrong. I'm, I'm asking myself because um, a century later, now we are having this, uh, um, what they uh, did with the rodents and the fish, so now we, we can show on a, on a map, neurologically, um, we can show a process of, consi of consolidation and deconsolidation. And I was just asking myself the question, for example, a concept like uh, catharsis, can it also be mapped on this um, on this map of uh, neurological processes, or is this even a thought in the whole model? Well, I I can tell you that the consensus in the psychotherapy research world is that catharsis doesn't work, mm -hmm. um, and that for example, if you have someone beat a pillow and expressing anger, it amplifies the anger. It, it doesn't diminish the anger, for example, uh, but could you understand what the neural basis of a catharsis kind of experience is? Yes. Um, but I don't, uh, I, I personally have trouble connecting that. Let me put it this way. By catharsis, if you mean activating the memory and getting in touch with the emotional pain and ex experiencing that and expressing that, absolutely. But I think that's just step one. I think you need steps two and three. So one last question. We have to prepare for landing. <laughs> Thank you. So um, my question is regarding your teaching. And um, so you, you showed your understanding about emotions, about memory and change. So how did this change your teaching style? How did it change my teaching style? In the classroom. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure it really has, but um, I think it's, really, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's important to think about because, um, well, people remember things when there's an emotional engagement, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, uh, a colleague of mine began a, a lecture about the amygdala by pounding on the table, okay? Well, I haven't forgotten that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent question, and all I can say is I'm going to try to make the teaching as emotionally engaging as possible. <laughs> yeah. Famous last word. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Richard. This was a wonderful talk and wonderful discussion, and we are so happy you are here, and we are going to start to work tomorrow morning. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so to everybody.